Hi, I'm Izzy. I'm here to explain to you the three most important rules in painting and understanding the logic of light. These essential rules of light for painters are uh, really easiest to grasp if we consider them in a theoretical vacuum, kind of like space. Uh, in our model, we're only going to have one source of light and our object or objects. Uh, we'll use simple objects for this to start. Rule number one. Objects and parts of objects most perpendicular to the light source receive the greatest amount of light. Soak it in. Most important rule, rule number one. This rule will affect uh, all of the rules to follow. So first thing that I like to think about is the light source itself. So we're often taught to kind of think about light in terms of a point and then the point kind of comes at our object like so in a ray. The fact is generally uh, our light source no matter what the size from uh, the lowly light bulb to the sun uh, will cast kind of in a whoops sorry guys will cast kind of in a spot type of array where all of that light comes out in ray form from that center point. That's important to remember for uh, further rules coming up. But in this situation, for rule number one, let's think about it just as that single ray. When I am thinking, to get back to what I was saying a moment ago, when I'm thinking about placing a light source in a uh, scene, I will try to r draw in that light source and its directions so that I remember this rule number one. And it will always, it, it will be my sort of note to myself what I'll do is, let's delete this. I'm sure you guys have seen this before. I will draw light cone. It's a cylinder, and it'll have a little cone on the front that gives us a little point. Now, the reason this is better than just kind of giving yourself a little dot in your uh, Photoshop file or on your canvas or whatever is this gives us a clear indication of the direction of where that light is coming from, or at least that primary ray that's coming towards your object. It can come from any angle. So this guy's coming towards us. Whoops. Wow, I am on point today. Or more extreme, this would be like our backlight situation. We're going to stick with this guy first. And we will add another light source over here. Just to get this is just to really drive home rule number one. I'm going to put this in kind of a top-down concept. So we have our object. We'll have a sphere, right? And our light source is coming towards it. This is us looking at it in pure two dimensions. The perpendicular part of an object is the part that is directly facing or at a right angle to the ray or that line from the light source. So that will be the brightest spot. It is the only place that can be the brightest spot on that on any given object, the most perpendicular point. Okay? Rule number one, super important. I'm gonna get rid of this. Keeping in mind the rule as established in 2D, you know what? I'm just gonna leave it there just to kind of be my reminder. Okay. So I'm going to leave this guy here. And he will recommend, it, it will uh, continue to enforce that light source going in this direction, but I'm treating it as all straight rays coming from that one direction and from over my right hand shoulder as I hit this thing. So, first let's move this over here and take a look. So, three dimensionally, if that thing is a perfect sphere, this kind of looks like the place that it's going to hit. This is the most, down here is the most perpendicular spot on that sphere. So that means that is the hottest spot that we can light. Oops, gotta deselect. Now I know spheres are, and, and basic shapes in general, are super boring to watch someone paint on. But um, like I said, these rules are foundational. And I'm going to knock back this uh, the shadow after the terminator here in order to really emphasize that single light. 
if if we were truly operating in a vacuum, you would not see any reflected light. This would be pure black back here, but I think it's important to kind of see the entire sphere so you don't get lost. Okay, and again, just using a simple round brush, we're not really worrying about making anything look pretty. We're just worrying about driving home these three basic rules. Most perpendicular spot related to that light source, right around there. That is the brightest it can be, which means this value right here, there can't be anything around here as the object falls away from that perpen most perpendicular spot as it becomes, as it falls away towards a parallel, uh, it, it gets darker. There's no point out here in the reaches of this sphere from the, our cutaway where it will be as bright as it is on that perpendicular point. And we're showing that in our little modeled form here. Okay, get rid of that. Let's say we're doing it from an angle now. We go back to our little light layer. We're going to draw in our little cone light source, our light arrow. I like to keep this thing on a separate layer because sometimes you'll end up getting it caught up in your, uh, in your work and you don't want that. You'll end up having to paint over it later. Sorry. Okay. Now we have this light source coming from the side. This is our two-dimensional. This is pretty much the same exact thing. Our most lit spot will be the most perpendicular from this direction of light. That is the brightest part of the form. You cannot have any other part that is as bright as that. Hard and fast rule. As the, the uh, form of our sphere turns away from the light and becomes more parallel to our light source, it becomes darker because the light no longer has a surface to bounce off of. Got it? So, perpendicular to the light gets the light. Objects is, that are parallel to the light in our vacuum get no light. That's where the terminator begins on rounded forms, and it will just go to pitch black like in space. Okay? Always remember, perpendicular gets the light, gets the most light, and as it becomes parallel to the light source, it loses the light. Now, you may be thinking, all right, well, that's all well and good for a simple sphere. Who the hell cares about that? Uh, painting is much more complex, and uh, that is insufficient information. Well, you're correct. Let us introduce a new object in our 2D uh, contour or cross-cut scape. And we'll, this new object will be a little bit more crazy. So imagine this is like a, you know, a cross cut of a, uh, a pillar or even a mountainscape or something like that. Let's approach it with the same logic that light is coming from directly above. Now, here's the interesting thing. My rule is hard and fast. Any part of an object that is perpendicular to the light is going to pick up the most light period. I just like saying P because it fucks with the mic. So this is perpendicular to the light. This is perpendicular to the light. This is perpendicular. Here, 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 here. See what I'm getting at? So all the hills and valleys are perpendicular to the la that light source are the places that will have the option for the most light. Most of your light, uh, or rather uh, the strongest lights, can only be in the parts of the object that are perpendicular, all right? And this, can, this is absolute and true of any shape. doesn't matter what the shape. We're going to make a, we'll make a simple, you know, other cross cut. And we have a crazy light source from above again, because, you know, I'm wild that way. Excuse me. 
So, are we going to have really bright light here? No, no part of this is really directly perpendicular to that light source. Um, no, no. Right here, that's going to have some pretty bright, bright brights available to it here as well, here as well. That's not to say that these will not have light. Remember that on our turned form here, we're going to go back to our sphere. There is light as the as any forms begin as any form begins to turn away from the light and become parallel, but it's never as bright as that perpendicular spot. Remember that. That's rule number one. Let's put it up just for our emphasis. So let's apply this rule number one that we now understand in two dimensions to a uh, slightly more complex three-dimensional shape. We'll use our previously established light source. Let's pull up this guy. This guy has corners. Okay, so I'm going to treat this not as a true cube, but just to kind of uh, illu illuminate you on this point. So we have our light source here and it's coming at a nice raking angle. Um, I'm going to just use this light value to create edges. Whoops. I need to log off this layer here. Okay. Let's create some quick edges. It doesn't matter. It's not meant to be perfect or anything. Now, I have this light up here, and you can see that this is, if this point is coming towards us in space, you know, and we're going to kind of use these contour lines to round out this form. This point is coming towards us, and then each of these lines are receding back in space. We have our light source up here. We don't have any clear perpendicular face of this object that is going to pick up the most light. Oh no! Well, as uh, our rule works, the next most perpendicular face will be the brightest. So in this case, I'm going to choose here. I'm going to use lasso tool just to speed this up for you guys. It's not going to be as bright as the uh, as the sphere would be. There's not any. Oops. Accidentally selected. It's not going to be, you're not going to have any real point on this that's so perpendicular that you're going to get your brightest bright. We're going to, sorry, select out this one since this is going to get light too, but just a little bit and definitely less than the face that's more perpendicular. It is, none of these faces is truly perpendicular. But it has some perpendicularity to it. It's not completely turned away. Oh, what about these guys? We're in a vacuum, right? So technically, we have no atmosphere, no bounce light. This should be full black, but I'm going to leave a little bit of value in there so you can see what I'm doing, just to, just to be clear on the, uh, the shape. All right, so is this clear? Your brightest, if we wanted to get super technical about this rule, your brightest spot is actually going to be this edge. Just this one edge. And this is how you end up with those nice sharp edges on things like swords or cars or whatever that's going to have a sharp right angle and you don't have a light source that's directly perpendicular to one face. It's per most perpendicular to an edge. So I hope this clearly illuminates rule number one. Rule number two. Light's power recedes on objects the more distant they are from the light source. Seems pretty straightforward. You see this, you see examples of this phenomena all the time when you are, for instance, you know, have your headlights on in a car or using a flashlight. Objects that are close to you are more illuminated, and as they get further away, they become dimmer, and the light doesn't affect them as much. If you have a light source that's super close, or sorry, if you have an object that's super close to your light source, that object, the parts of it that are most perpendicular, don't forget rule number one, that's number one most important, will be lit brighter, and as things get further away, it will be less and less affected by that light source. Even that one seems too much. 
So let's erase this out. Let's dim this guy a little bit so I can show you what I mean. Let us move our light source to make this really clear. And let's assume it's all all the light is coming from the sun style rays. They're all coming from that one direction. This is the brightest spot. It is the closest to the light. But remember, it's not the most perpendicular. Oh, we have a problem. This rule and rule number one seem to kind of be going seem to work against each other. So you got to kind of find that happy medium of what looks right. But uh, always, first and foremost, think most perpendicular, then follow with rule number two. In this case, it is almost perfectly perpendicular, so it picking up the most light makes the most sense. As the object begins to tilt away, we lose the light. This one is more perpendicular, but it is not as bright as that first one. Here it is perpendicular, and logically, based on rule number one, we light it hard. But rule number two says that the light diminishes. So yes, it's going to pick up the most light for this area, but it will not be as bright as it is here because this is closer to the light source. Very straightforward. And then of course this one is back up closer to our original light source. So it is perpendicular and a little bit brighter than that. Let's knock this back just a little bit more. And then this guy's even further than that one it'll pick up the most light for that area because it is most perpendicular to the light but it can never be as bright as this object which is part of the object which is closer to our original light source that's rule number two lights power gets weaker on more distant objects so rule number two has some pretty interesting concepts that kind of change how you think about light the first is Obviously, a, uh, the brightness is affected by an object's closeness to the light, but the other thing that is to be taken into account is the brightness of the light source itself. If you've got a light bulb, the light bulb is going to have a relative amount of lighting power that it's going to be able to give off, and then you have the sun, which is going to have a different amount, and that's all going to be relative on how you light your thing. The important thing to remember, you light your, sorry, light your image and objects within your image. The important thing to remember is that when you are working with different light sources, that when you map it, you keep in mind that the relative power of that light source is specific to the closeness of the objects. So example, you have the sun and you have a light bulb. If you have an object that's being lit by both, the sun is going to be more powerful than the light bulb logically. But if you get the light bulb super, super close to the surface, this might end up being a little, whoops, sorry, still selected. This might end up being a little bit brighter than this guy up here, okay? Things to note, light source uh, power does affect the second rule in relationship to other lights. However, if you think about it in the vacuum, and you remove the complexity of multiple light sources, that one light source, no matter what, the rule will always apply. So if we have the sun and we've got buildings, and then we've got cars, if that's the sun lighting from above, the top of those buildings will logically be brighter than those cars below. That's assuming they're made of the same matte material and all things being equal, okay? We will get into materials later as I teach you uh, other things, but you have to have these foundational rules first. Okay, let's take a look at what this would look like in, with our three-dimensional objects. So for this, I'm going to make a copy, and I'm going to combine it, merge, all right, shrink it down a little bit, and this should look familiar. We've seen this sort of thing before. Now the most perpendicular point where this light source is hitting boom right there now if I were to move this up here notice that this doesn't feel right the most perpendicular point isn't the same anymore and it's because our terminator hasn't shifted so if this were a three-dimensional object and I was moving it you would notice that the terminator shifts and that point of that center point that is most perpendicular to your light source will shift too so we're gonna move this back to where it was ah it's bright look at that 
and then we're going to add another one. Now this other one is not being blocked by this first one and we'll just kind of assume that it's maybe a little bit further from us in to the distance. We're not accounting for atmosphere because we are in the vacuum of space. But I will dim this down because it's a little bit further away from that sun. We'll make another one. And this one's further away. Let's say this one is really far away, so it's not so not so much of a gradient. This one will dim like this, which feels a little bit it feels pretty natural to me actually that that amount of light is that weak at that distance. So here in three dimensions we can see an example, uh, simplified of course, but an example of rule number two. Light's power recedes on objects that are more distant from the light source. And there's one more way that we can examine the concept of rule number two. And that is uh, how we might think about it in respect to the sun hitting the earth in uh, macrocosm or maybe you know a nearby light source like a light bulb uh, lighting a floor boom look at this guy so I'm gonna transform him just to get some three-dimensionality to this okay so now this is a plane like a floor like a, a floor in a garage and we're gonna reappropriate our Sun and we're gonna move it here we're gonna say our Sun is now a light bulb in, a, in, in our garage. All right. So this light bulb in our theoretical garage will be directly over the center of that plane. Now remember what I said about rule number two. Light's power recedes on objects the more distant they are from that light source. Well, if we were to measure out the most perpendicular point from here to here, this is going to be our brightest spot on our uh, on our floor. I measure that spot out. I'll take, make a copy of our, you know what, I'm just going to make it into a new layer, of our ray pointing to the most perpendicular point on the floor. Now, using the wonders of Photoshop, we'll transform that ray and rotate it with our light source is the center. Now notice that you have this amount of space from here to here is now an extra distance on that floor. So this part of the floor is further away from that light source than this part. Yes, it is perpendicular to the light source. Well, uh, it's technically not perpendicular to the light source, but for uh, the purpose of what we're talking about, it is perpendicular to the original light source. But you can see now that it's further away. So we're kind of seeing a combination of rule number one and rule number two taking place as we light our garage in a vacuum. Let's transform it again. Center on our, on our light source and we'll move it out so that it's pointing towards the corner of the garage. Look at that. I'll draw a line out from our most perpendicular point and that comes back here. Look at how far away that is from the light source. That's, this is the actual distance now. Check that out. That is quite an, uh, quite an addition of length, which means according to rule number two and even rule number one, as this is kind of turning away, this is not a perpendicular, this is not at a right angle to our original light source, and it is a little bit further distant. It's not getting, it's not gonna pick up the light the same amount. So with the, all these fun graphs and kind of maths in mind, let's go back to our, let's go back to the sun, or sorry, the, the light bulb in our garage, and we'll light the garage floor. Same, I'm gonna use a bigger brush just to kind of get the effect going. So the brightest spot that it can possibly be, all things being equal with an even matte uh, material, the brightest it can be will be at that most perpendicular point on the floor and the closest to the light source. Here we are seeing prime examples of rule one and two working together. How exciting is that, right? You know, I'm going to use a smudge brush just to speed this shit up. Now, in terms of your painting, 
let's say you're painting so let's say you're painting this exact scene and you you notice things are starting to feel kind of like, kind of a little bit muddy like look at this guy right over here i've got this brighter spot and it just kind of it's making it look like there's a lump on the floor well the fact is is that that is too bright for that area so we just need to dim it down a little bit and let that decay of light happen because it is no longer perpendicular and it is not nearly as close as that most perpendicular point. So do you see now how rule two stacks right on top of rule one? Cool, huh? I'm sure you can see a pattern now here uh, as we're developing these three rules, each one stacking on the, on the previous and obviously number three is going to stack on the other two. Um, keeping in mind that we're keeping the notion of our um, lit object from one light source in space, we're going to introduce a second object. So we're going to get rid of our, our ray here. And we're going to go back to our little sun guys, our little planets. Copy, paste, transform. We're going to put this guy on top of our plane. with the concept that it is between our light source and the plane. This comes in, this brings us to rule number three. Sorry, let me turn off the sun there. If something solid is between your object and your light source, the object being blocked gets no light. Go, oh, sorry. My layers are a disaster because I'm painting this all live right now. How exciting is that? All right, so we're gonna go back in I'm going to use the eraser and we're just going to assume that it is blocking the most perpendicular point of our plane. And I'm going to erase it out. Now remember, we're operating in a vacuum, which means there's no bounce light. There is no atmosphere. So technically this would be pure, nice, delicious black. And remember our rules. Because the our little planetoid is closest or not our planetoid, our sphere in the garage that's floating and hovering and scaring the shit out of the kids is closest to the light source. It, where it is most perpendicular to the light, rule number one, will be brighter than any perpendiculars of objects behind it according to rule number two. You can jump ahead and just use a smudge brush because I'm lazy. Now I'm leaving out the uh, reflected light from the floor of the sphere. It's a solid object. You know what, we're gonna move it further down just to really kind of make that clear. Okay, so if we were to put an object like a bar in front of the sphere, let's knock back that lightest light of the sphere because it is brighter than the next object closer could be, which means, relatively speaking, we got to knock back the floor too. So we've got our bar on top. We're going to give it that shadow side. We're going to light the other side, picking up the light source. I'm going to zoom in so you can get some some clear vision here. Now, look at this. We've got our bar that's kind of, I'm going to draw the contours of it on there. Our bar is kind of like the sphere mixed with the plane because we have this longer surface and then we have the short surface that's rounding that's going to create our, our form shadow on the, the pipe. So this longer surface, same rules apply. The brightest spot on the pipe is going to be the most perpendicular spot to that light source and the closest. As the distance increases and the angle of attack diminishes, it gets dimmer. See how it's looking realistic, even though we're just using a simple brush, we're using simple tools, but because we're obeying these simple rules of light, everything is coming together. Well, we're missing rule number three, 
which is our cast shadow. Objects that are blocking the light from other objects. Oops, I have the... Now, we have an interesting situation here. You have a cast shadow moving into a form shadow. And this is going to be a hard and fast rule with out thinking about the more advanced notions that we'll get to later of reflected light and atmospheric light. When you have a hard edged cast shadow moving into a soft edged core shadow, the cast shadow wins. Its edges always win. It will be hard going into, let me zoom this in, going into the soft of the core. All things being equal, it's the same materials, right? And that there is no reflected light. We are in a vacuum, and we are only acknowledging one light source. Okay, so that is rule number three in action. So let's review our three essential rules for painting objects in space and getting a realistic effect are first, oops, let me get rid of that light, <laughs> damn it, Photoshop is conspiring against me. Objects most perpendicular to light get the most light. Rule number one, it trumps the other rules. Rule number two, light's power gets weaker on more distant objects. Rule number three, if something solid is between your object and your light source, the object being blocked from light gets no light. Okay? Any of the light that you would see in a cast shadow is the result of more advanced stuff that I will be sharing with you later, including atmospheric light, reflected light, and some other fun and fancy uh, rule exceptions to the rule. All right? So now, if you're with me and you've got a full understanding of all these rules, you can see where they take us next. Uh, considering these three basic rules, I, I'm going to add one more sub rule that's really going to bake your noodle. You ready for the mind blowing time? Let's turn back on our light. Sorry. Every object that is lit by your original light source itself becomes a new light source. This is where all reflected light comes from. Okay? The important thing to remember when you start um, applying more advanced concepts like reflected light is that it obeys these first three rules just like the original light source. Always. Those are hard and fast rules. So now let's, uh, let's kind of apply that real quick and see what it looks like. So we've got our initial light source. We are no longer thinking about this initial light source. Our awesome scene is already painted and everything is sorted out. Now, let's go down the list. We have this light source, th th sorry, this object here. And this object isn't really lighting anything else. It's just bouncing light directly back into the original light source. But hey, look at this guy. This guy, the, our sphere, has light hitting it and there's an object so let's start all over and think about this object as a light source it's going to be bouncing the light back in the direction that the light came from okay when you have something that is lit and it is now our our new light source you have to think about its local light how bright it is as being the brightest that it can be. So remember our little description of the sun versus the light bulb? Same damn thing. It's just this time that light source is just a matte sphere. Okay? This light source is going to bounce right back up and hit the bottom of our pipe. Now, it's tempting to get all in there and be like, oh, I'm doing reflections. This is going to be so sexy. And reflections usually are because they really round out of form. But you'll notice if I start getting really noodly and loving on this thing a little bit too much, it's getting a little too bright. Remember the rules. Rule number one, the most perpendicular spot of this pipe is going to get the most light from this new light source. Don't think of it an as an object. It's a light source now. Where it's most perpendicular, oops, sorry. Boom. That's going to be the brightest spot it can be. Because light 
our first light source is hitting this light down here, creating a new light source, where it's going to go next is diminished light. So none of this light, uh, n n the brightest spot on this thing cannot be as bright as this thing, unless it is a reflective object. But again, materials, that's later. So we're going to not be that bright, and we're just going to hint at that lightness, creating a sexy little reflection right there. That is reflected light, or rather an implied reflected light. Okay, does it make sense? Well, let's take, a, let's take a look at this. So we also have the light bouncing up off the floor. That's going to hit this bar too. But you know what we're going to do is we're going to do each light source independently and see how they compound on each other. So first, first thing was we're going to get that pipe. Rule number one, that's the brightest spot. I just broke it with that stroke there. The brightest spot is the most perpendicular. Rule number two is distance. There's not any other object, so it doesn't really matter. Rule number three is blocking light. doesn't really matter. Okay, so now we're going to go down to our plane. Our plane is being lit by our original light source. Our noodles are baked. Our plane is a light source. It also is moving upwards like this. Ha-ha! How exciting. Now we introduce light to the bottom of that sphere. Now that reflected light can never be as bright as that light source. Again, materials notwithstanding. All things being equal, they all have the same materials. So there's the reflected light from the floor. You know what, let's give it a little bit more juice. Okay, seeing that nice rounded area now? I'm going to give it just a tad more to kind of create an edge. Okay. Well, this light new light source, the floor, is bouncing up. It's hit our sphere. Now, look at this. There's another object that's going to catch light that is perpendicular to our light source, the floor. Now, this time, this object is further away. So, rule number two, diminishing returns on the light. It's not going to be as bright as this reflection will be, but it's there. Now we can get into things that are a lot more complicated like the fact that this object is casting light up but it's being blocked by this sphere so it's going to kind of equalize the values at the bottom but uh, you know let's not worry about that too much now that's getting a little bit advanced but if you're thinking about it that's good if that, if that was popping in your head that's what I'm wanting we have created reflected light back up into our objects, but oh, wait a minute. Now these objects have reflected light on them. Now, what do you know? That's a light source. We're going to do this, follow the same rules. Rule number one, most perpendicular, back into our shadow. That's going to be the brightest spot of that reflected reflec reflection of light. Um, but remember, you don't want to think about it as, as a bounce, 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 bounce. That's where you get confused really easily. You want to think about it as each time you reach that new object, it is now a new light source and you're now following the new rules. Um, the light being bounced, it, can, it cannot be as bright as the original light source. And remember, we are not throwing in atmosphere, we're not using any of that other juicy stuff yet. This is just the first three rules of light and we are creating uh, more realistic looking scene just by using those three rules on each object that's in the scene. Hmm. <laughs> it just occurred to me that if you have been paying attention to everything I've been saying so far, you have been grinding your teeth because I haven't been paying attention. And that's because I didn't map out my cast shadow from my pipe. Right? So I'm going to just operate with uh, the concept that the, um, the light source is con oh, God damn it. <laughs> the light source is constant, uh, like the sun and its distance, and I will show you how to map cast shadows at a later time. This is just me pooping it in there so that people don't freak out. This can get infinitely more complicated when we're talking about lighting in a room, but the 
cool thing is. You don't need to worry. Um, the mystery is gone. It, you, you know that you can map this out. If you master these three basic rules of light, you should be able to see the objects in your painting looking more realistic right away. First, take the lighting situation um, from a photo and try to analyze it. So instead of painting and, and figuring things out by uh, you know, putting your, your objects into the space and then doing the perpendicular line and so on and so forth, let's do the opposite. Let's, um, let's figure out where the light source is on an object that's being lit already where we cannot see the light source. Excuse me. So according to our rules, we know rule number one, most perpendicular to the light source is where you're going to pick up the most light. So uh, materials, glossy things, and fur are going to fuck with you. It's going to take some time to really learn how those things work. But in general, we can kind of assume that the brightest spot that we're looking at is going to show us our uh, our light source, which is somewhere up there, but kind of coming from the direction of this sphere. Okay. The other way that we can test that is with our cast shadow. Look at that. There's this nice cast shadow from his lordly chin, and uh, that cast shadow tells us that our light source is somewhere up there. You see it? Perpendicularity. That's the brightest spot. Brightest spot. Brightest spot brightest spot. The most perpendicular point points you directly towards the light source. Cool, huh? Well, how about rule number two? Diminishing light as it goes into the distance. So you've got your brightest brights up in here, but these values, well, color pick. Now watch out with uh, black and white photography. You want to look for things that have clean, uh, relatively simple lighting situations, ideally just one light source with no reflectors or anything like that because it's going to get tricky. So I'm going to pick the brightest bright down here and you should see if we put them right next to each other there's actually quite a difference in value between the brightest uh, that we have, the brightest part of an object that's closer to our light source than something that's further away. Certainly local material colors and local material values will change some of this but the rules are there. They are visible. And then rule number three, again, we had our cast shadow. So we have this, the chin blocking the light. You can see our cast shadow here. So there they are, all three rules right there in a photograph. Okay? If you can master these three rules, everything that's to come will be much easier and it will all make sense. The next exercise is to. Um, take it to the next level. You would take your photo that you have found online or whatever that has a particular lighting situation. You will create your own scene with your own shapes. Very simple. Don't try and make a... I know that this looks like a landscape thumbnail and uh, they often end up looking this way but this exercise is a great practice. You create some shapes in there take the lighting scene, uh, the lighting situation from your photo and then apply. We know that our light source is going to hit. Um, these are going to be the most perpendicular surfaces. We know that this one's going to be a little bit further from my light, light source than this one. Whoa, sorry, that's my dog. She's freaking out. Kova, chill out. Yeah, I'm talking to you. You'll be good. She's not listening to me. All right. Uh, so that's uh, the second exercise that I highly recommend. After you've analyzed a photo and figured out where the light source is coming from, take that light source and plant it into a new uh, composition of simple three-dimensional shapes. The third one is to practice, uh, practice these three primary rules with a still life. So set up a still life and then paint it in black and white and do it in order. First, figure out where your light source is on the still life. Boom. Uh, you know, draw in your your objects. This is this will help you with your. Um, th this is sort of like the next expansion of the previous, the previous assignment that I give. You would light it according to what you have, 
and ignore all reflected light. And it's going to be hard. This is really hard. When your eyes are telling you to th what is there, well, you're going to have to use the logic that I've explained to you with our first three rules to dissect it and take it into its individual pieces so that each light source, meaning the original light source, and every object is a light source, is affecting everything in order. So start from the top and then cascade down mapping out where the light works and and for the entirety of it use rule number one rule number two rule number three okay all right well that's it for episode one of Izzy's logic of light and color where we tackled the first three rules of lighting if you found this video helpful please subscribe for future updates follow me on Twitter and Instagram at, at cannibal candy Find in-depth articles on painting logic and philosophy at cannibalcandy.com. I'm adding demos and videos available for purchase on gumroad.com forward slash cannibalcandy. And if you have a heart for adventure, please consider checking out my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash cannibalcandy. There I'm launching a whole new project devoted to art, adventure, and teaching on the high seas. See you on the flip side.